There's another one you don't want to hear. Frankly, if you do I. Hello and welcome to episode 68 of the Power Chord Hour podcast. How you doing out there? Thank you so much for checking out another episode of the show. As always, I am your host, Anthony Merchant, here with you with another one. We're inching a whole lot closer to 70, and uh, that's a whole lot closer to 100, crazy to believe. But uh, yeah, here with you again, a another solo one for you. And uh, I thought we would talk about, I was going to do this uh, a little later on, but decided we would do it uh, this week to kind of, you know, kind of go along with last week talking about, you know, the uh, my favorite records of the year so far. I thought we'd look back 25 years now and, uh, you know, kind of do like a class of 1996, kind of look back at a handful of uh, some of my favorite records from that era. And uh, I mean, I got, I got to say, like when getting getting this around and I did this last year, too, I did the uh, 1995 retrospective. And, uh, you know, went back for the 25 year anniversary for those, but kind of, I mean, kind of the same with that as well. You start looking back and like, I'm not, I really never remember what year things come out. I'm not good at that. Like, like very rarely. And you think I would be good at that? Cause like, it's something that I will mention doing radio, like, you know, and, and I definitely did more, uh, when I did like top 40 radio, like if you did like, you know, like old songs or, you know, like we'd do a retro request, and, uh, you know, you would be like, hey, like this this fucking song from I, I couldn't say fucking because, uh, you know, FCC. But, uh, you know, the, this fucking song from 1983, you know, it, it was on the Billboard charts for, you know, at like number three for four weeks in 1985. Like, you know, shit like that. But I'm never really good with that. You know what I mean? Like, I know, obviously, like roughly like I can tell you roughly like a year now came out like. Like if you took if you took all the albums that I have sitting here in front of me right now that uh, I'm going to talk about and I didn't say I didn't know they were from 1996. And you just told me to like label them. Uh, a few of them I probably would hit on 96, but would be out of pure luck because I think I would look at them and go, okay, I would think of the window of like between 1994 to like 1997, 98. You know, like a four year window. So like, you know, mid 90s, I'm kind of like that, you know, it, it's kind of like the, it could be 95 or 96 for all I know. So, you know, I had to sit down and, and, uh, you know, really look at the records that came out 25 years ago and, uh, what a solid year for music. I mean, to the point that I had to cut this down, there's a, there's a lot of records that, uh, I was thinking about talking about that I just will not, will not have time to talk about, you know, I can only, uh, I can only talk so long about uh, albums that came out 25 years ago but you know like I said really really good ones you know this is this is just scratching the surface I, I would definitely implore you to go uh you know if you're bored and like you know like themed things which if you're listening to a podcast about albums that came out 25 years ago I, I'd say you don't mind uh themed things and uh I would definitely say go go look up like a list, you know, Wikipedia that shit or uh, anywhere else and just look up the records that came out in 96, insane year for music. And uh, I'll I'll put up a, a playlist too, an accompanying uh, Spotify playlist for this where uh you know, I'll do, you know, I'll I'll talk about like a handful of records on this, but like, you know, I'll, I'll do a bigger one there where like I try to kind of hit more of it, you know, like more of a summary of 96 and I'm going to be able to do in here, you know, for an hour or however long this is going to be, you know, but, uh, yeah, really, really good year for music. And, uh, we will kick it off with one that, you know, I was born in 92, so there's not many like songs and things that I like particularly remember coming out in the nineties, but this one I remember, I remember the song, I remember the video and uh, it is Super Drag with Regretfully Yours. That one came out March of 1996. And uh, yeah, sucked out. I mean, a song, a minor hit, you know. I mean, definitely Super Drag's most well-known song. Uh, a minor hit. It wasn't. And that's kind of the theme here. I, I will say I notice, uh, and it's not me trying to be like too fucking cool that like I pick those records. But like my favorite albums, a lot of them I notice that uh, I'm going to talk about on here, you know, the, you're, you're going to see a pattern here and I'm kind of telling you this now, but 
you know, bands that were on a major label that had a minor hit that like, you know, it did okay. Like it probably hit like rock radio, never really went to top 40, you know, nothing like that, like nothing huge commercially, but maybe got played on MTV, uh, you know, maybe on 120 minutes or late at night or something, you know, like, it, like again, it, they would be around, maybe they do like super drag, like they do one or two late night performances, you know, they do a few things, but like, you know, super drag is very much a, I, I always say they're the big star of the nineties. And I mean, the replacements too. I mean, you, you could say either one because the replacements are the big star of the eighties. And, uh, you know, I would say super drag are the big star of the nineties where it's just like, I would say it's a band that really sums up the best parts of their decade, you know, in, in like alternative music and stuff like, like really, you know, I think big star has like, really they, they fit. I, I feel like they do a lot of things that you hear in other bands that are, you know, now considered classic rock at the time, I guess we're just considered rock bands, but you know, they just do it in such a way where it's like, I think they have the best parts of it. You know, I, I, I think they kind of, they, they write better songs and they highlight, you know, just the better parts of, again, what we now call classic rock. You know, like I, I always think that I'm like, you know, like number one record is like the, the album that like, like some of those songs, you know, whether it's 13 or, uh, you know, maybe even like in the streets, uh, like, you know, like something like that, where it's like, it probably should be overplayed just like a Led Zeppelin song or just like, you know, a Rolling Stones song or something, but like, you know, it's not. So, I mean, I, and I think that's the other thing why Big Star, I think I love and a lot of other people do too, is it's, it hasn't been played to death, you know? So, I mean, I do think of that too. It's like, pardon me, goes, I wonder if some of the charm, same with Super Drag is like, because they never got huge, you know, maybe we wouldn't love sucked out as much. You know, or at least me, maybe I wouldn't love sucked out as much if I heard it ad nauseum like you do, say, all the small things with Blink or something like that, you know. But uh, again, like Super Drag, you know, uh, had minor hits and, you know, minor success. Commercially, actually, probably did sell. I bet regretfully yours sold more than uh, any of the three or, or four uh, big star records. Uh, and really, maybe even the replacements for that matter. I'm not sure, but I think reg regretfully yours did go gold. I'm not entirely sure. Don't quote me on that. Look it up. Uh, you can search it on whatever the hell you're listening on the, this on. You can uh, look that up. But I'm pretty sure it went gold. And if it didn't, I think it at least had to sell a couple hundred thousand. You know, like, like again, like I think it did okay. But like this is a record that should have been huge. Like, and, and I always say too, I, I also say this, uh, you know, going down the things that I always say about super drag in this record. But, uh, I, I think that a head trip in every key is their best record, but this is my favorite. Regretfully yours will always be my favorite. And 100%, I mean, not, I don't get me wrong. I'm not taking anything away from it, making it sound like, Oh, it's not good at all. But like, I'm just saying, if you're comparing them both, I think they really just went so, I mean, to follow this up with a head trip is insane. So, I mean, I think just if you're thinking of, of musically, I just think, yeah, head trips, their masterpiece, but this one will always be my favorite. And like I was saying earlier, like I remember sucked out. I remember the video, uh, it probably like, I don't know. I don't really like, I watched 120 uh, minutes, uh, like the videos like on YouTube now, I, I never remember seeing it on TV. I'm sure I did when I was like a baby, but like, you know, I, I don't recall it anymore, but like, it's probably what they were playing sucked out on, but it's like, I remember seeing the video and the song and, uh, loving it at whatever I would have been. Uh, if I was born in November 92, this came out March 96. So, I mean, what I'm three or four. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really, the, this song was awesome. And, uh, the funny thing about this album, like, I don't recall any of the other songs. I don't know if I ever heard them. I, I just don't know this. I just remember sucked out and, uh, for years I forgot about it. Then I was probably like 12 or something and then randomly remembered it and, uh, started listening to it again. And then years after that picked up regretfully yours. And to be honest, I think the first few years I, I, I had that album, I didn't really pay attention to it. I maybe listened to it once or twice, maybe. And, uh, you know, didn't hate it, but just wasn't, I just don't think I ever gave it a fair chance. You know what I mean? Like I was so like, that's where nostalgia really plays a role. Like I think I was just so nostalgic for that song and remembering it 
that I never, you know, like gave the rest of it a chance. I think even Everclear, I kind of did that where like I liked the singles and like remember them from like being younger that like, you know, you're kind of on the nostalgia thing where you don't realize, oh, wait, no, like sparkling fades like really good you know what i mean like the like these hits and stuff like everything to everyone is a good song but like no the shit and saying like santa monica but it's like oh no it's like the deep cuts it's like side it's this you know like b-side a sparkling fade that's you know like the really good stuff and uh same with here you know I, i i didn't really give this album a chance for a long time and then just at some point i i really i just gave it a listen i guess and uh i don't even remember when but just it just kind of clicked and I was like, Oh my God. And, uh, yeah, this whole record is like, like, and, and like, if you really want to talk about great openers, I mean, this record right off the bat, I mean, right off the bat, it, uh, it comes and hits you slot machine. Just, just, it hits you in the face. They don't fuck around. You know, even, even the intro is really good. You know, like the, the intro gets you really, really pumped up and uh i mean after that too you have slot machine and then one of the most like everyone who knows this record and you probably know if you know this record you might even know what i'm about to say but i mean that that transition from slot machine into fraser is one of the most flawless beautiful sequences i've ever heard on a record like if we're like it you always remember that and if we were talking about like best sequencing on an album that's one of them and really, I think this whole record sequenced well. Like, this is a listen to front to back album. You know, like, this is definitely a record that you put on and you listen to the whole thing. And it never gets old, you know. And, and again, like, Sucked Out was a minor hit, but it never got overplayed. So, like, you even get to that. And I still get very excited when I get to that song, you know. And, it, and it's like, and I think it's a great song. I think uh, it should have been bigger. But I don't know that it's even the best song on the record. I think my favorite would probably be... It would, oh man, is it, uh, oh man, I'm trying to remember the name. Is it Carried? I think it is. It's track three. It is, uh, it's the one right after uh, Phaser. And yeah, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I'm right on the name. I, I don't have it in front of me, but it's Carried. I'm almost 100% certain. But again, if you want to see if I'm wrong, uh, j- just check on whatever you're listening to this on. Go see if my ass is wrong on that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love it. I and Destination Ursa Major, I forget that was also the other single on there, and I don't think that one, that one, I think didn't really get any attention. I mean, I'm sure it got a little, but like, yeah, just just really overlooked. I mean, there's Super Drag, Harvey Danger's another one, you know, like Where Have All the Merrymakers Gone, where it's like, and really Flagpole Sitta was a lot bigger. Like, I think Harvey Danger in the grand scheme of things probably was. And and is bigger in that sense because and I don't know like to be honest I will say this if you go into a bar you'll hear Flag Pulsita or if you put on the radio you hear you'll hear uh, Flag Pulsita or a movie yeah like I mean if you if you watch a movie trailer or a movie from like the early two thousands late nineties like you will hear that song whereas Super Drag you're not really gonna hear it uh and actually shout out oh my God what's it called oh. Yeah, Caffrey's, Caffrey's in uh in Minneapolis, or I used to go there. They had the best uh, subs with some vegan vegan chicken and hummus, and uh, I forget what else I got on it. But the main the main thing was it was like toasted with a uh, really good vegan chicken and hummus. And uh, I remember going in there, and whoever was uh, playing the music there, I mean, amazing, and they did play. I forget what song. It was off Regretfully Yours, but I can't remember what song. Damn, they played that. They played Teenage Fan Club. Uh, I want to say they played the Posies. They, I, and you know what? I Oh, I know. They also played Super Chunk, and that's when I realized that they're uh, – I remember that. <laughs> it was going alphabetical. I forget what it started with, but I started realizing after, uh, after uh, Super Chunk, Super Drag played – and then I forget what played after that, but then Teenage Fan Club played, and I started like realizing, like, oh, like it's going alphabetically. So it's like I don't know that they picked that song specifically, but it was on their iPod, and uh, my God, like so good. So shout out to whoever the hell was working at Caffrey's 
that if you're working at Caffrey's that night in 2019, shout out to you. And uh, the sandwich was quite good as well. But yeah, like that's the only place besides uh, Shameless Plug, my own radio show that I think I've ever heard uh, Super Drag on the radio. Like I've never, or, or like anywhere, you know what I mean? Like I, and I just heard uh, Flag Pulse the, the other day in a bar. And again, when I was doing that retro request uh, at the other radio station, we got requests for that song constantly. Like that always got played. And, uh, you know, so it's like, but there another one though. With that said, Harvey Danger gets no love outside of that song. And that whole record, just like this one, is just front to back flawless. You never get bored. Um, it's just so good all the way through. And you just don't understand why it wasn't bigger. I will say, though, with this record, uh, Regretfully Yours, I do think if you think of the time in 1996, I I wonder if it wasn't like quote unquote grungy enough, you know, because and the other thing, too, is you couldn't really label them like like, yes, they're big star and replacements, but it's like just like them, they mesh a lot of uh, different influences. You know what I mean? Like this record is power pop. It's punk at times. It's shoegaze. It's straight up rock and roll. And it's all in one. You know, I mean, like and, and that's the other cool thing, I think, on this record, too, is. I mean, you definitely wouldn't call uh, Super Drag like a shoegaze band, but like I would say side B of this record, there is foreshadowing uh, some of what they do in the Leaves of Memory. Because, you know, they do a lot of uh, John and Brandon who do that, which, I mean, if you've never listened to Leaves of Memory, I always give them my seal of approval. Um, you know, they're they're so amazing. You know, if we can't have Super Drag, this is a great, this is a great, uh, you know, consolation prize or whatever. They're uh, They're still doing it. But, you know, they have kind of a more shoegazy influence on the new stuff. And uh, if you go back and listen, it was always kind of there. You know, and I would definitely say even more prevalent on side B of this record. But, uh, yeah, it, like that's what I love about it. There, there's times where, like, it's very, you know, it, it just goes in an interesting place where, like, like, you'll think you know where the song's going. And then it'll just do something very like they've always been very talented musicians, even young. Like, I don't know how old they were there, but I mean, they had to be early 20s. And uh, it's one of those records where if you really listen to it and you think about it, just like the replacements, which I, you know, I'm sure this isn't a surprise, but I'm going to bring them up a lot as, uh, you know, comparisons because the greatest goddamn band of all time. And uh, we will respect our God, Paul Westerberg. But, uh, you know, just, just like the replacements, you know, if you listen to their early records, it's like so beyond their years. Because if you start thinking about it, if you listen to a song like If Only You Were Lonely, you know, like, or even Shiftless When Idle. I mean, even something like that. I, you know, it's like, oh my God, like these guys are like, how old? Like, you know, like early 20s. I mean, Tommy Stinson, my God, you know, early teens, you know, like, like 12 or 13 years old. And uh, yeah, I mean, same with Super Drag, where it's just like John Davis, I mean, writing these songs, it's like, I mean, my God. And, but, but I mean, all of them, that whole band, again, the musicianship is excellent. You know, they have always been, a, a really really good band and i've never been able to see them live but i've seen video and they were definitely a good live band as well there's a solid uh performance of sucked out on i can't remember who probably david letterman uh one of the late night shows from whoever was on 96 i think david letterman but uh well worth checking out on youtube and uh, just a great performance of uh sucked out i i love that's the only thing i love about that song is just john davis's like just the rawness when he's when he's yelling like who sucked out the feeling and it's just like he's just he's like yelling it you know what i mean like like he's controlling it he's controlling his voice but he's he's really fucking giving it like i i just love that you know like like this whole record is just from front to back it, it's great it, it's not uh it's not too long it's uh you know it, it's just the perfect uh you know amount which there are some records just go too long, and this one, this one doesn't. Doesn't overstay its welcome. It's like just the perfect amount, and uh, it goes enough different places. Like again, they they just like Big Star, just like the replacements. There's rockers, there's ballads, there's you know like everything in between. There's different, uh, you know, even kind of like Cheap Trick, you know. And I'm sure the Cheap Trick's a huge, huge influence on a super drag. I wouldn't even be surprised if they, uh, ever covered them or played with them, but, uh, yeah, just a, uh, a very great band. And, uh, I will throw this out here. No one, no one better steal this idea. Instead, you need to hit me up 
and we need to start this band. But I always thought a great cover band, you know, now, now that bars are starting to open and shows are coming back, do a super drag and a super chunk cover band. And that's all we play a super drag and super chunk songs. And we're called super drunk. And we just go to dive bars and play. I mean, like two of the most underrated nineties bands and uh, just play a shit ton of super drag and super chunk. So if you're down for that, I mean, hit me up. We should get that shit started. But you better not steal that from me. That was said here. If uh, anyone says, if anyone, if you, if I ever hear that band existing uh, after this and I'm not in it, I got to kick someone's ass. But uh, anyway, we're going to get back into this. Uh, I love this record. Not a bad song. Sequenced perfectly. You know, again, like sequencing such a uh, important thing, you know, to a record because it's like I think sometimes that can fuck a record up too, to be honest. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't say I will say good songs are good songs, so it won't destroy a record entirely. But it's like if the flow's not there, the record won't be as good or as memorable. You know what I mean? Like I think most not most all my favorite records are sequenced really, really well. You know, there's not a lull. There's not a place where I skip three songs. Like I, I want to listen front to back and you don't do that with every, there's records that I really, really like that I'll skip around to. And I, I think most people are that way. You know, now, now that we're in a time where you can do that, it's like, there are many times where if I'm listening to a record, if it's a 12 track record, I'll listen to seven songs, you know, I'll listen to eight or something like I'll skip around, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's easy to do. And, uh, but this is one of them where I do not do that with, you know, I would say most albums, uh, that I'm talking about on this, I do this with the, but I will be honest, some of them, like I, like I did mention on here to foreshadow for later, uh, you know, this is like the perfect amount of time. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's like the perfect length of an album. There are some albums even on here where it's just like, we don't need 17 track albums. Very, unless you're doing a double record. See, this is, you know what it, you know what it's like a 17 track record. That's not a double record is, is like a, uh, is like a show that has like seven bands on it, but it's not considered a festival. You know, like where there's like one headliner, like one national act or something. There's like six or seven local openers. It's like, oh no, this is a festival. Like this is, if this thing's going on for eight hours and I'm seeing like eight bands, like, no, this fucking thing's a festival. This isn't a show anymore. This is a festival. And that's kind of the thing with like a 17 track record. It's like, oh, if this isn't a double album. You're like, you're like kind of tricking me. You know, you're, you're kind of, you're kind of trying to fool us with this, uh, with this shit, but no, not super drag. They know better, which funny enough, they've, uh, with the Lisa memory, they did a, a double record, but it was really good. Actually. Uh, I'm trying to remember you know, the, um, uh, I can't remember now. It was the one before this last one. I liked it, but it was very experimental and Beatles esque. but again, it is good. Like th- that, that's where you have to go. There is, there are times like, you know, Lisa memory where like, I like more of the rock stuff, because there is like there is shit in there where I go like you hear what Super Drag would sound like if Super Drag was still around. like to be honest like uh, Unnecessary Evil which I think is their uh, best record that I think in a lot of ways probably would be whatever Super Drag record like if Super Drag would have put a record out in 2016 the year that came out that that would have been it you know what I mean like I think if you slapped the Super Drag name on that record a lot more people would have like looked at it. Which is too bad because they should just look at it on its own merit. But, you know, John Davis is forever. I mean, he's like an Alex Chilton or a Paul Westerbring. I'm, I'm going to keep using that, you know, the big star replacements. But, like, just people who music fans, like, recognize but, like, just does not get looked at, like, is the genius songwriter that they are, you know. And even that, like I was saying, like, their double record, The Lisa Memory, the double record that has, you know, sounds very Beatles-esque. Like the thing with that is like, oh, it may not be my favorite, but it's like, goddamn, they're talented. Like they sound like the Beatles in the best way. Like they don't sound like a knockoff. Like they're doing like Beatles esque and they're doing it very, very well. But uh, yeah, just excellent band. And I mean, it, it's insane too that they followed that up with a head trip in every key. I mean, that was probably, I'd say that's their peak songwriting. And John Davis is like peak songwriting. But I mean, even just them, the band, you know, like firing on all all cylinders was regretfully yours into uh, a head trip in every key because uh, that would be kind of cool too because regretfully yours doesn't sound bad, 
But I would kind of like to see what uh, Jerry what it would have sounded like if Jerry Finn produced it because I thought he he did such a good. I mean, a head trip in every key is one of the best sounding albums too, and uh, and it's funny I, I own that record on vinyl. And uh, I just recently, and it's funny, I, I guess it's because I have no desire in getting rid of it. I love that album. I wouldn't want to get rid of it. But uh, I, I've, a lot of times I just look up for the fun of it, like albums on eBay that I own, or not even fun. Sometimes it's like, hey, if I, this album I haven't listened to in five years, it's worth a couple hundred dollars. Oh, I could use that. Like, you know, sometimes that happens. But I wouldn't do it this. But I looked, and that those things are going for $200. Like, goddamn. But uh, yeah, Side One Dummy who pressed that uh, a few years ago and they put out some Lees of Memory stuff too. Uh, Yeah, they should probably repress that. Same with uh, Regretfully Yours, which I don't have on vinyl and would love. And that goes for, I think, even more. I think that was going for like $250. Like Head Trip was $200 and uh, Regretfully Yours was uh, $250. And, uh, and, And also the other thing before I move on to the next record, what a great album title, Regretfully Yours. I love that. Like that, the album art, like everything about it is like, I just absolutely love it. It's just so fitting. And uh, and again, and that kind of reminds me of a Cheap Trick as well, actually, kind of. Like the title, the album cover, and uh, all that is kind of Cheap Trick-esque, in my opinion. But uh, really, really love them. Love Super Drag so much. Moving on, a, another band, talk about a one-two punch with uh, album releases, but Weezer with Pinkerton, a uh, a masterpiece. This one came out in September of 1996. Before we even get into it, I mean, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, because I'm sure the burning question in your head right now is, Anthony, is it Blue or Pinkerton for you? It is, in fact, Pinkerton. Pinkerton, it, you know, there was there was a time where it, I, I struggled with that question, and then one day it just finally clicked and I go, nah, dude, you know the real, you know the real answer. But this is another one where I go, it, it's kind of similar to, uh, and it's kind of why I wanted to talk about this next, but it's like, it's similar, I think, to uh, Regretfully Yours and Head Trip in Every Key, where I go, Blue Album can be your favorite. There's, it's, I mean, every song on Blue Album's good. Like when I say Pinkerton's my favorite, don't get me wrong, Blue Album's a flawless record. I love that album to death. It is one of my favorite albums, but like I just like Pinkerton more. But it's like it's the same thing where I go Pinkerton's better musicianship and better songwriting, just like Head Trip and Every Key is, you know. And uh, and even though it's lack of production on uh, Pinkerton, it's like I also think the lack of production is a big charm of the record, just like the amount of production on Head Trip is the charm of the record. Like I think there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, similarities there. And uh, and I think well, regretfully yours, I believe, is their first record because they did have like EP. That's what I'm trying to remember is they had EPs, but I don't think they ever had a record before regretfully yours. I'm trying to remember because there were a couple random releases, but I don't think I even were full length. So regretfully yours was their uh, debut, and Head Trip was their uh, was their follow up, if I'm correct. And uh, same with Blue and Pickerton. I mean, like my God, like fuck, like so good. But uh, but also too, both of them not having obviously Weezer having much more success than Super Drag, but like you know again having follow ups that just didn't really you know like musically were superior to the to the albums that they had beforehand. Like like they're much better, but it's like the mainstream didn't seem to think that or radio or whatever whatever reason it is. Sometimes even the label just don't doesn't give it a chance. I will say about Pinkerton though, like I got it after I got into like I got the blue album first and really got into it. And I got Pinkerton a little later on. I don't even know if I got it second. I might even got it like like Make Believe was probably around when I got into Weezer, that was around 05. So like that was up to Make Believe. So I had probably heard a few of the other ones where I heard Pinkerton. But when I first heard it, I really wasn't into it. Like this was another record where it was like, yeah, it took me a few years, I'll be honest. But like it's an album that I think it's better as you get older. Cause like I still think, like even listening to it today getting ready for this uh it's just like listening to it, i'm always like oh fuck like i always forget how good this album is like it's just so it's so good but also at the same time it is kind of crazy because like when you think of a uh, blue album and how big that was for them for them to follow that up with pinkerton and it is you know raw production and it is kind of not kind of it is darker and you know it does have kind of more complex and adult uh subject matter than blue does you know blue's a lot more fun 
you know, that's kind of, you know, honestly, like blue is more of a summer record to like roll down your window and like, you know, on a sunny day and listen to Pinkerton isn't that album so much. I think Pinkerton's better, but I don't think Pinkerton's the one I'd want to listen to like on a nice day driving down the highway, you know, um, but again, both uh, very, very excellent records. What I wonder, because it's like the thing with this too, is you have to give credit where credit's due. Like Rivers, and I'm not the first one to say this, obviously. I mean, and this album's been talked about millions of times. I mean, nothing I probably say about this record is brand new to anyone. But like R- Rivers really does deserve credit. Like how candid and personal the lyrics are on this album. Even to the point where times where it almost gets awkward or like uncomfortable, but it's like, you know what? You can't, you can't, like, it, you got to give them, those are some candid fucking lyrics, you know? Like, whether you like them or not, it's like he's being extremely honest and uh, in a way that he never did before or ever did again. And, uh, you know, and I wonder, I wonder about it too. Like, it's one of those what ifs, but it's like, I definitely think the rejection was like why he just didn't, you know, why he kind of. You know, I I don't want to, I don't just want to shit all over him. I think he is an amazing artist. I I do love his music, but like, you know, dumbed down, quote unquote, his music in a lot of ways afterwards and just also not be so personal. You know, like Island in the Sun is a lot less personal than like Tired of Sex. You know, it's just a little less personal. And, uh, and, you know, there's still merit to those later songs. There's still good songs in there. And honestly, I mean, I got into them in a... I I really at this point in life only really like Blue and Pinkerton. Those are the ones I'll put on. I mean and and they're not a band I will change if I hear on the radio, at least like older stuff, but it's like I just I'm not really a fan of later stuff. I uh I liked I can't remember the name, the one that came out in 2014 that was like the big return to form and then they just went back to writing shitty records. But uh everything will be all right in the end, I think. But that one was pretty good when it came out. I haven't listened to it in a while, though. I don't know if it's held up. But, uh, you know, like like nowadays, I really just like the first two records. But, you know, there was a time where I liked the uh, later ones. But I, I've just kind of dropped off. And, again, it's not to say that they haven't written good songs since then. I just don't think they've written a good album, as good of an album. Because I will even still give Maladroit and Green Album um, those still have, I think, a decent amount of good songs. And even, you know what? Red Album is a very underrated one. Red Album actually has, like, the first half of the Red Album is pretty good. Um, there's a few songs on there and I'm not crazy about. And I think the second part gets a little, I don't know, it gets a little weird as far as I recall. Another one I haven't listened to in a while, but, like, I think it just kind of gets odd. But, like, the first half is actually pretty damn good. But uh, getting back to Pinkerton, I mean, th- this is one where, again, it's kind of a big what if, but it's like, if this record wasn't, you know, if this record had, was successful, if it did, you know, if it did bring them success, if it was a hit on MTV and radio and everything, like, I wonder what Weezer would have sounded like, because I don't know that they would have sounded like they ended up sounding, you know, I don't, I don't think they would have, I don't think green album would have sounded like it did, you know? And, and again, I, and I'll say that on, you know, not even in a good or bad way, but it's just like, I don't think that album would sound the way that it sounded. I really do think this, that the success of this album would have, uh, you know, really depended on how, how river's songwriting ended up going after that. But here's what I'll say. I'm not throwing under the bus saying something like, oh, like, fuck him. Like, he, you know, because this wasn't big, he's like, oh, I'm not going to write like that because I just want to be big and famous. I don't blame him for not writing like this anymore because, again, it's so candid and personal that I think it's a different level when it's rejected. You know what I mean? Because here's the thing. And actually, it's kind of I, I haven't really thought of this before, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking of it right now. But, like, you know, the rejection that that you know, we older Weezer fans give like the newer stuff when they kind of shit on like, like new stuff. I doubted stings as much as it did when people didn't like Pinkerton because Pinkerton on an emotional level, there's parts of rivers in those songs. So when, when it got rejected and it didn't get played on the radio and stuff like it, it hurt on another level because he really put himself out there on that one. You know, I re- he really he really gave you a part of himself. You know, kind of was like autobiographical. Whereas with the later stuff, if you go, I don't I don't like this new single. That's you know, 
I don't even know. Like, I don't even know anymore. I, I don't even pay attention. But like, you know, California kids or like something like that, or even just Beverly Hills. Like, if you don't like Beverly Hills, it's like, okay, well, you're just talking shit about a song on Beverly Hills. You're not talking shit about, you know, a really deep personal song about like a, a relationship I have or like, you know, some, you know, something else. It's like, I, you know what I mean? Like, like I, I really think there's a difference there where I think it probably stings a lot less when you put that. I, I do think he has a coding on where like, and don't get me wrong, sometimes I think it's just, you know, you do just want to write. You know, I also don't think there's any shame in just wanting to write fun, catchy songs. But I think when it, when it you know, bleeds in and like destroys the band's sound altogether is where the problem is. You know what I mean? Like, and I, and I think that's the thing. It, it's not so much the problem is that he wants to write songs like that. It's that he just doesn't. It's like, you know, when you listen to what he did write and what the band could do, you just kind of get bummed out. Like, why why can't we have more of that? You know what I mean? Like, uh, I was kind of thinking about it too today. And it, it's not as personal as a lot of the songs on Pinkerton, but on uh, on the Red Album, going back to that for a second, um, I can't remember the name of the song. I think it's Heart Songs, but it's the one where he's just going through all the different, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Heart Songs, but he's going through all the, uh, you know, just different songs from his youth and like, you know, songs that got him into the band, into uh, music and stuff. And it's a really sweet song and really good. And again, it, it's kind of personal. Not as personal as a lot of like Pinkerton songs, but it is personal in a way where it's kind of like touching. And like I like when he does that. And I feel like he just the less and less he does that, I think uh, you know the quality really hurts for it. But uh, you know, on Pinkerton, it, he definitely left nothing off. You know, I, I think this record is uh, is just really, really good. You know, it, it became a cult classic. And had it been big when it came out, I think it would have changed things for him. And again, like, I, I really do. I don't think it's some kind of thing where it's like, you know, oh, fuck this, we're not selling records. I think it's like, oh, this kind of hurts. Like, people are not liking it when I, like, put myself in here more, you know, than, than I do in Surf Wax America or My Name is Jonas, you know. But uh, musicianship on this one, you know, on Blue is good, but I think on this is even better. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think... Uh, it, it, the 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 high harmonies on here too. You do hear them on a blue album, but like Matt Sharp's high harmonies are great on this. You know that that's a big thing. It's funny to say, but like uh, of of things to miss about Matt Sharp being in Weezer, those high harmonies on the first two records. If like you don't realize the importance of them, but if you took them out, like you lose. Like look at Buddy Holly, one of their biggest songs. Like the, like that is such a big part of that song is Matt Sharp doing the doing those high pitch harmonies and uh you know it, it's just like he he really and I, you know also I don't I don't know songwriting honestly I don't know how much he had to do with songwriting back then but I mean his bass playing and stuff obviously amazing on those records but uh yeah his high harmonies are definitely something to uh you know to give credit to but yeah this record is uh you know I'm far from the only one to say it but I mean I I love this album And, uh, you you do, you look back on it and I forget that sometimes, but it's like, it is kind of a crazy follow-up. Now, I don't think blue was ever written to be a big record. Like, cause that's another one. It's like, it's, it's ironically probably their biggest record and best selling one, but I don't think it was written to be huge. Like, I don't think they ever thought that record was going to be as massive as it was. And, uh, you know, I think with Pinkerton, they kind of had the same thing and it didn't happen, which sucks. But I, I think I think at the beginning their best records are the ones where they weren't trying to get big. But like on Blue, it's like, yeah, they weren't trying to get big, but you would think on the follow up they would try to like replicate that sound and instead they didn't. They didn't write Blue Part Two, you know, like like at all. And uh like you gotta really kind of give them credit for that. You know, maybe it's self destructive in a way, but uh I, I think more than anything it's staying true to the band and why it's such a good record, because that's the record that they wanted to write. You know, I mean I know the whole like songs from a black hole and everything but like this uh this album which i'm kind of happy they didn't do the uh space opera you know i i don't know i think i think this is this is a better that may have been a crazier follow-up just because blue was a big record for them and it did sell a lot of albums that like a space rock opera i don't know should be the follow-up 
But, uh, you know, I don't know how well that would have went over. But again, this one didn't go over well. But uh, I, I think this album is uh, really, really good. I love this album. And I want to, you know, flip side of Weezer, uh, Nerf Herder, who put out, I think it, it was, the, it's such a strong debut. I think it's still their best record. But their self title that came out December 1996, right at the end of the year. And uh, I mean, it's it's Weezer with dick jokes. You know what I mean? It's it's humorous lyrics with solid pop punk and pop rock instrumentals. You know, very like a lot of songs mid tempo rock like uh, Weezer. You know, but again, like a lot more a lot more jokey and uh, you know a little more uh, crazy. But uh, in, in a way, though, you know, in a way where they're not a novelty act. That's the thing with Nerf Herder is like first and foremost, like yes, the songs are funny. And everything, but it's like they're not they're not in a novelty way where it where it's a joke that wears off or something. They're like the vandals, you know what I mean? They're kind of like the vandals in that way, where it's like the vandals will joke around. And I will be honest, there's a few uh, vandal releases where I go, okay, I, it's it's like all right, the joke gets kind of old. But like most of them, including like Hitler Bad Vandals Good, that's a classic. And like that's an album where it's like those songs are ridiculous, but you don't, you know what I mean. You don't get tired of them. Like you'll actually listen to that. It's not something where like Weird Al is great, but you really have to kind of be in a mood for Weird Al. Weird Al, you don't just throw on. You know what I mean? That's not. You really got to be in the mood for that. You know. And uh, Nerf Herder, Nerf Herder is really good. Where yeah, it's funny and everything, but it's not like a novelty act or like just comedy where it's like you need to be in the mood to laugh. It's like it's just a great record. This is a. It's kind of a good summer record. I, I know I always use the, the uh, just kind of the whole like, oh, rolling down your window on a hot summer day or whatever. And that's great. But I don't know if this is an album to blast on a, a hot summer day because like it is a funny record. But like, yeah, some of the some of the uh, lyrics are like, I don't know, they're just not things. Not, not that they're problematic or anything like that, but they're just like, yeah, you probably shouldn't blast uh, some of that stuff. Like like breaking through windows on acid and uh, everything, but I, I will say my introduction to this band and, and when I fell in love with them, I'd never heard of them, and it was it would have been either two th- it would have been like December like like winter two thousand eight or spring two thousand nine, and uh, I believe it was on XM radio. I believe it was on satellite radio in a rental car or something because. Uh, yeah, for whatever reason, I remember that. that part, I don't know why, but I remember that. It was in a rental car. But uh, I heard Van Halen, the song Van Halen. And I don't even think I heard the whole song. I think it was in the middle of it. And then the bridge comes in, and he talks shit on uh, Sammy Hagar. And uh, I fucking hate Sammy Hagar. And that was around the time that I was getting into Van Halen. I was, I was like early teens. And uh, I fucking, I still, with a passion, hate Sammy Hagar. I don't know why I get it. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's unchecked. I'll even admit it's a bit much at times, but I really fucking hate that guy. He just, when I look at him, I want to punch his fucking face. He fucking, I would rather listen to Gary Sharon era Van Halen than his fucking, uh, terrible albums. But when I heard that song and the whole Dave lost his hairline, but you lost your cool buddy. Can't drive 55. I'll never buy your lousy records again. I was hooked. I was, I was, but funny enough, I was hooked, but didn't go check them out right away. And then like a year or two later, got their self-titled record used at a FYE. I will say though, at the time, um, you know, I was too young for a, a credit card and stuff. So I couldn't just go online and like buy these albums and you really couldn't find this album. Like including around me, I don't have a lot of, you know, if I went to Buffalo and stuff, there'd be record stores, but you really couldn't find. And, and I say then, but even now, I don't think you can really find Nerf Herder albums in, in stores that much, including then. That record was already, I mean, in like 2008, 2009. It was already like a 12-year-old record. Like, it was probably out of print. And, uh, you know, like, like you really couldn't find them. I remember you could find, I think it's four. I think their one album's called Nerf Herder 4. And I think that was like their latest one at the time. Like, I remember seeing that places, but that wasn't the one with Van Halen. So I didn't want that. But I eventually got the one with Van Halen. That is this one, the self-titled and uh, I love it. This one, this one, unlike other records, I got into this right away. This is again, it's just a fun album that like you're you're into instantly. You know what I mean? It doesn't it doesn't take a lot. Like and it, and uh, again, this is an album perfect amount of time 
and realizes that it's like, all right, we're jokey and stuff. This shouldn't be an hour long record. It's 10 songs and it's 30 minutes. I mean, how perfect is that? It's 10 songs. It's 30 minutes. It's, it's not a whole hour. It's a little, little sliver of your day. Like it's perfect. You know what I mean? It doesn't go on too long. And, uh, I, I really think half of this album really could have been hits. And again, another one with a minor hit with uh, Van Halen being the uh, minor hit on there. And uh, they did do a video for uh, Sorry, and I, I, I mean, maybe a minor hit, but I don't, I don't really know that it that it ever did anything. Uh, you know, I, and people also know them for like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the theme song. But uh, you know, I think Van Halen's like their biggest, besides that being the theme song. Like that's kind of like the with the Refreshments, who I'm actually going to talk about here in a minute. But, you know, like with them where it's like, yeah, most people know the King of the Hill theme song. They don't know that's them. And uh, same with Nerf Herder. It's like they might know the Buffy the Vampire theme song, but they don't know that it's Nerf Herder. Whereas the actual song that gets connected with Nerf Herder, I would say, would be Van Halen. And uh, just like with later on the refreshments with Banditos, you know, I I would say that more than the uh, King of the Hill theme song. Because people don't know. You know what I mean? It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, they've heard that song. And, uh, you know, same with Nerf Herder, funny enough. A lot of people probably wouldn't know who Nerf Herder were if you asked them, yet they have heard them because they've heard the Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, Slayer theme song. But, uh, yeah, this album is uh, awesome. I think half the album could have been hits. Sadly, obviously, it wasn't. But I also think you hear on this, you know, because it is funny and everything, but also very, very catchy, I think Perry Grip, if you don't know, I mean, really huge with writing like jingles and I think like cards and like children's music and stuff. But like you kind of hear it on here where it's like, yeah, I mean, it's a lot more adult themed, you know, like down on Haley and stuff's a lot more uh, explicit than, than like his, his song about waffles or hamsters. But uh, you know, still like they're catchy, they're short, catchy songs, you know, like they're not too different from a jingle. And, uh, and the other, the other thing too, I think Perry grip is very good at grabbing your attention with the lyrics within like the first few lines of a song, like, cause he'll, he'll say something really out there to like open up a song and you're like right away. You're like, Oh, okay. Like I'm, I'm into this. I think that's a big lyrics are a big thing on this album because the music, the music is good, but it's very kind of straightforward and simple. Like I said, pop rock, pop punk, and, uh, you know, not too different from like blue album era Weezer. And, uh, you know, which, I mean, later they toured with. And then later, later on, on their latest album, which is uh, five years old already, which is insane to think. But a great album you should, should go check out, Rockingham. But uh, they have a song on there called We Open for Weezer. But uh, yeah, that's a good album, too. This is still their best, though. They're a self-title. But, uh, again, I think the lyrics play a big role. You know, the music is pretty simple, straightforward. I think the thing that really sticks out on this record are the, are the lyrics. I mean, which really, it makes sense. Like I said, Van Halen caught my attention cause the whole Sammy Hagar thing. And it also makes me happy to know that Sammy Hagar did hear it and it pissed him off. And, uh, I don't remember what he said, but he had some shitty response to it. And, uh, yeah, fuck that guy. But yeah, this record, I mean, just so fun. It's fun without being a novelty again. Like I think that's, that's the best thing I could say too. And I, I, I mean that in such a good way. Like you can listen to it. You can laugh. Like I, I've been listening to that album now for well over a decade, and uh, I never get tired of it. Or go, oh, the Joe. You know, like you, you still laugh when, when you know, at like Nose Ring Girl. You know what I mean? That song's never not funny. Like the drums in that song, even like just everything about it is so fucking funny. You know, and it never won't be. So you know, kudos to them because that doesn't always work. A lot of times, the uh, joke does wear off with uh, artists. But moving on, a band I just told you I was going to talk about later on, and when I meant when I said later on, I really meant like right now, and is the refreshments with Fizzy Fuzzy Big and Buzzy. This one was out February 1996, and I can tell you how long I've been listening to this album because I bought it on it was you know it was the day after. It wasn't on my 21st birthday. It was the day after. So the band Army of Freshmen, really really great band. You should go check out. Um, they haven't put much out in a while, but they still do things from time to time. They're a rad band. Either way, you should go check out. But uh, they used to have a podcast. They, they, I think they still do, actually, called Fresh Talk. Go check it out. I think they still do it. But uh, this was way back. This was 2013. So, uh, yeah, I'm 28 now. 
So yeah, I've been listening to this record for seven years, even though it's been out for 25. But uh, and, and funny enough, actually, before this, I will say years prior, I did randomly look up like, oh, I wonder who does the King of the Hill theme song. And I saw their freshman. It's like I was aware of them for years. And I actually listened. Funny enough, it was back in the day on iTunes. I remember listening to 30 second previews of a few of their biggest songs. So I probably listened to like band like 30 seconds of Banditos and uh, maybe a few other songs off this and their other record. But, uh, you know, I, I thought they sounded good. Uh, I was always kind of like, oh, maybe I'll buy their album if I ever see it and just never did. And, uh, again, though, it was like 30 second clips of like four songs. Now, years later, I'm, uh, in Pittsburgh for my birthday and, uh, like, I don't know, I think on the drive up there, I was listening to it and, uh, listen to that, listening to their, uh, podcast, Fresh Talk. And they were talking about like underrated records and that, that record they were talking about. And, uh, you know, again, like before I was like, oh, that's a band I wanted to check out way like in, in high school, like, like 10th grade, I was, I was considering checking them out for like a week basically. And then like now fast forward and I'm like 21 and I'm like, Oh fuck. I'll have to see if I like see their album. And I went to, uh, this is regional, but if you're in the region where they're at, I went to the exchange, one of those fucking things where, uh, not fucking, I actually really like those, but, uh, real quick, a gripe. And, uh, if you, if you've ever been there, this is, this is a gripe you have too. You have to those fucking price stickers they put on. If the things in cellophane, fine. You, it's fine, but if you buy a used album or DVD or game or something, any, anything that's in a loose case, basically, it leaves the worst sticker residue. Uh, half the time, the sticker like half rips off, so you still have that like white shit all over it. Like it's just awful. I don't know how all these years and they've never figured that out. Like it's bullshit. I have to take Goo Gone to clean them off. But anyways, let's get back to this album. But uh the music gods for my 21st birthday the next day, uh I I went into the exchange and was looking around and when I'm looking in the dollar bin uh where a lot of amazing albums are. Like never underestimate the dollar bin. I was in an exchange a few weeks ago and uh not only did I buy Insomniac on vinyl, but uh, I went over that dollar to that dollar rack, and I bought a couple compilations, Drive Through Records Greatest Hits, and a couple others I can't remember right. Honest Don's, and a couple others. But like some of the best records you'll find in the dollar bin, like that. That is really like a testament. Like it, the best music's not like like that's just stupid. Like the best music's not the most expensive album. You know, like that CD's sixteen dollars, so it must be really fucking good. Like you know, so like going in the dollar bin, including because it's like it's, it's not a gamble. It's a dollar. Like, that's it. Like people spend that on a stupid fucking lottery ticket that they'll never win anything on. Like spend a dollar on an album that might change your life. Like, you know, and, uh, yeah, I saw it and I'm like, Oh fuck. Yeah. And, uh, at the time I was rolling around in my 98 Volvo, uh, RIP, I think it was an XC, but, uh, that one had a CD player in it and a tape CD player tape combo. And, uh, yeah, I popped it in, drove around Pittsburgh listening to that and really, really fucking good. Right, right away. I was, uh, with blue collar suicide, like, you know, Roger Klein's a lot like Perry grip in that way where, uh, and really, you know, it, it's funny cause there's parallels and the refreshments are humorous, but I don't think there is on the nose is nerf herder. You know what I mean? Like, and they'll even be kind of dirty, but they will, they'll be more innuendo, you know, they'll be more about innuendos and stuff, I think, than uh, Nerf Herder are. But, uh, you know, I mean, that they, they have, again, like a band that doesn't take themselves too seriously and also a sign of really good songwriting. Like Roger Klein is not a name you hear a lot when you hear about good songwriters. But this man's lyrics are just so, again, like he right away, like with Blue Collar Suicide, that's why I was like, those lyrics you listen, you're like, God damn, like really, really good. They just pull you in. And musically... They're a really good band. Like, they have a sound of their own. Like, I will say, like, there's... I think you'll hear similar things in, like, you know, whether it be, like, Gin Blossoms or Dead Hot Workshop or other, like, bands that, like, contemporaries from, like, the Southwest. But, like, they may have similar, like, maybe certain things. But overall, there's not a band in the world that sounds like The Refreshments. You know, I don't think there's a band that sounds straight up like them. And, uh, I mean, this record's so unique, like just listening to him, like, 
I I don't even know. It's another one where it's hard to place where to put it. You know, super drag to a point. You have that with regretfully yours, but this even more because I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what bands you'd put them with. I don't know. Like I gotta say, like in kudos, even though they never got huge, the fact that this was on a major label, like this is, it only could have happened in the '90s. I really think this is a record that you only ever would have seen on a major label and I don't mean that in a bad way it's an amazing record but I just don't ever see like a you know a label taking a chance on a band that just again because like I'm saying you can't compare them to anything so like as far as marketing them or throwing them on the right tours like that's probably part of the reason why they never got big was like I don't know who the fuck they play with I mean, you could play radio festivals or like other radio, you know, bands around the radio at the time, like alternative rock bands, but it's like, they don't, you know what I mean? They don't, at least with super drag, they could play like a power pop band or like, you know, just like a straight up, whatever alternative rock or indie rock band of like, you know, the era was, and I think they could get along fine. Whereas yeah, with uh, refreshments, I don't know who you play with, you know? And funny enough, I've seen them twice and I don't think anyone opened either time. I don't, I, there's, which it's like, it's not, you go and it's like its own spectacle. And it's like, but it's amazing too. Cause what I'll say is they've never gotten the mainstream success they deserve, but they've carved such a niche for themselves that like Roger Klein, the peacemakers and the refreshments, like just that whole world they have such a cult following and it's like they do so well for themselves. Like places are packed. Like when I saw them at the grog shop in Cleveland, I think it's sold out. It, it's, I think one of the few shows I ever went to there. I've been to a few sold out shows there, but that's one of a handful. And it was just, it was packed and, uh, and it was great. Actually, it was Roger Klein and the peacemakers playing fizzy, fuzzy, big and buzzy. And, uh, Oh, I can't remember this. I think it's pH and I can't remember his last name. But uh, he is still, he plays with Roger Klein in there. So he's the drummer, I want to say. Yeah, the drummer, I believe, of the refreshments. So, I mean, Roger Klein is kind of a continuation. You know, it's kind of, it's again, it's kind of one of those things like with the Lisa Memory with Super Drag. It's kind of that where it's like, all right, this is probably what the refreshments would sound like if they were writing a record, you know, like in the 2000s, you know. And uh, and I would say go well worth checking, well worth your time too because the refreshments only had really uh you know this one their next one and they had like an ep and uh i think it was wheelie was another one they had and that might have been a full length but it's like you know it's kind of rough around the edges and uh you know like, i mean okay stuff but they're the, the the like real ones you you want to hear are uh this one and the uh the next one which I'm, I'm blanking obviously if you could tell i'm blanking on the name and it's a it's a really good record but what i will say that one sounds more straight up like Gin Blossoms, Tom Petty, Replacements, kind of like, you know, you can kind of pinpoint. That one I feel like was a little more radio friendly and nothing wrong with it. It's a great record. But uh, that one actually I would probably say they probably should have gotten bigger off of because I think it was more like mainstream friendly per se. But, you know, Banditos, I mean, did okay for them, but it's like it is a good highlight of – uh the quirkiness and everything of Roger Klein's songwriting. I also think another one down together would have been a, a really good uh, single. There's a few others on there, but down together, I think stands out as one where I'm like, I, I think that could have been a, a single, but uh, his lyrics just paint such a picture. Like he really, like he really, you, you get in those situations, you know, like that he's talking about, like, you know, exactly. That's what I was talking about too. Like with innuendos, and even not even, not even just like sexual innuendos, but like even implications and shit with like lyrics where it's like he'll paint a picture without even saying, you know what I mean? Like he won't have to say where he's at or anything. You'll know right away just by what he's describing. Like he, he he's so amazing at it. Um, just so, so good. I, I think this is one of those. There's so many records where, again, like you, you always have to check dollar bins because there's so many good albums sitting in there. And uh this sits at the very top. I mean, if you ever see a copy of it, definitely grab it. It's on vinyl now too, and I don't. I haven't looked in a while, and I do have that on vinyl. And that's another one I will not get rid of. But uh, I, it's probably worth money because I don't think they've pressed it again. And they pressed it like I think in 2015 or 16. And uh, yeah, just such an amazing record. I, I love it so much. And uh, it was very cool to see them play that back in 2016. That was a great show at the Grog Shop. And uh, and very cool too in Erie at Basement Transmissions. I saw them do 
a uh, which this is another one like I was saying they're not a huge band but like I'll put it this way like they played a I think they put it up like two or three days in advance like a random show like on the way to another show or something like they didn't even know they'd be in Erie but it, like they just played a quick acoustic show at Basement Transmissions with a few days like in, in advance notice and like so many people showed up like and don't get me wrong it's not a huge venue but like the fact that they just threw that up people like like they filled it like right away the place was filled everyone was singing the songs like and that's the other thing too it's like people go to those shows it's like they'll still play, they'll still play refreshment songs but the people there still follow them and still know the new songs like they very much are supportive you know so like again the refreshments never really got the mainstream success that maybe they deserved but like they do get they do get uh recognition from their own fans you know definitely uh definitely loved by a, a cult following but uh moving on to the next record a pop punk classic MXPX with life in general out November 1996 and uh this album is just a damn ripper front to back uh it, it never gives it a rest either like this isn't an album that like starts doing like ballads or like acoustic songs and stuff like this is very much front to back just a fun pop punk punk rock record you know it, it's just so and really one of the like th- there's a bunch of things to compliment here but like i one of the things that always is sticking out stick out to me is yuri's drumming because these are like i think some of the band's fastest songs and it's like just those breakneck speeds, the fact that he can play drums that tight and even throw fills in and stuff. I mean, I think he, when you throw around really good punk rock drummers, his name doesn't get thrown around enough. And uh, I really think it should. He uh, He's extremely solid. And their rhythm section, because I mean, Mike Herrera too, I mean, underrated. As far as bass playing goes, there's a few bass lines on this record where I go, holy fuck, like he is... Uh, you know, he's really good. He And I will say, he I own a Stingray, and it's my baby. It's like one of my prized possessions. I love my Stingray bass. And uh, him and Roger Lima from Less Than Jake are like the two people who made me want one the most. You know, also like, you know, Mark Hoppus using one back in like the Dude Ranch era and Ian from Newfound Glory using one back in the day. But like the two main ones, the two big ones, and the whole reasons that I, I wanted one and tried playing one and then fell in love with them was, uh, yeah, Mike Carrera and Roger Lima. And, uh, yeah, his classic uh, Stingray tone on this. And just really, really good bass lines. Um, I think, too, the Stingray works because as a trio, it punches through really well. Because uh, Tom, Tom plays a lot of chords. You know, Tom, Tom's very good. Tom's not a flashy, like, he's not a lead player. He doesn't play solos and shit, really. He reminds me a lot of Johnny Ramone. He plays a lot like Johnny Ramone, which is a great, I mean, Johnny Ramone's a fucking legend. Like, you know, one of the greatest punk rock guitarists of all time. And he plays very much like him. So, like, I feel like with the wall of, like, distorted power chords coming from, uh, you know, Tom's amp, I feel like the uh, punchiness of Mike's, uh, you know, like, like classic, you know, basically now is classic stingray tone. It cuts through really well. And, uh, you do, you start noticing like the rhythm section there. Some of those bass lines with, uh, with Yuri's drumming is just really, really fucking good. And, and again, like so fast, like you forget sometimes that's they like those songs are really fast. Like a lot of those songs are just like, like faster than a lot of punk bands. Like some of those songs I think are faster than most fucking like bad religion songs, you know, like, or, or at least on par with like, you know, no control tempos, you know? Um, and I, I think this one, you know, I, it did okay for them. It's one of their uh, bigger albums. I think Buffalo did bigger cause Buffalo did go gold, but, uh, I still think the, you, this one holds up against just about any, any like pop punk record released in the nineties. Like, any of the big ones, Dude Ranch, Dookie, uh, Out Come the Wolves, uh, you know, Smash. I mean, any of them. Like, I feel this one holds its own with all of the uh, big ones. And, I mean, really any of them. Any any pop punk records that came out in that decade, I feel like life in general has to be up there as far as accolades of, like, the best ones. You know, I, I think they were just so – they are just so damn good. And it's so funny to think, too, that they were, like – you know, and and I don't know. It's all it's all secondhand to me because I wasn't you know a fan back in the day. I was like, again, I was like four or something when this album came out. But like the whole thing that they were a Christian band on Tooth and Nail, like 
I don't know how big they tried, like, you know, being, hey, we're a Christian band and stuff, or if they're just like, we're a band with some Christian values. But, like, even with that said, this record's not, like, you would never think of them as, like, a Christian rock band on this, or, like, that that ever is, like, you know, a thing. But, like, even even, even songs, though, I feel like on later, like, even, like, uh, on the next release with Today is Another Day, great great song and you know i mean even even kind of has that whole uh little god line in there it's like it doesn't you know what i mean it's not like it makes a song bad or anything you know but it's like it's just kind of interesting because you think of this record and even though it was on tooth and nail and at the time they kind of were a christian punk band you don't think of it that way you know i mean they're kind of like reliant k where i think i think reliant k and later on some of the earlier stuff not as much but like later albums i think they kind of uh held their own in a way where they kind of broke the mold of being, you know, kind of pigeonholed into a, uh, you know, into a stereotype like that, you know, that they're like a Christian punk band or something, you know. But uh, my buddy Steve Kravick, who has uh, been on here, also known as Stephen Bradley, uh, he was the producer on this as well as uh, Slowly Going the Way of the Buffalo. And I thought he did an amazing job. I think he, and I've said this before about Steve's production, but Steve, I feel like, will take a punk band and clean them up without making them lose their rawness. Like punt, like like MXPX, you know they they had earlier releases and there's good songs on them, but they're a little rough and they're newer. Now Steve got them after writing songs after a few years, but he also cleaned them up in a way where they were playing tighter. You know, I definitely that's the other thing with like uh, Tom's playing. Like I think Tom is very. Uh, tight with the kind of Johnny Ramone like rhythm playing and uh I think this is where he started getting really you know really good I also know I don't I don't think he played on like the first record but uh I think he still played on some stuff before this I don't think this was his first album with them but um you know really really fucking good like I think just they got really tight and I think Steve he made them not sound overly polished like some of the later stuff but I think that like I think their best sounding records was probably Life in general, and then uh, the other one I would definitely say would be the Ever Passing Moment. I really like the production on that one. I think that's another one where I think it was clean production, or you know, kind of slick production without like taking taking the rawness of the band. You know, like they were still a really good punk band, but it was like you know, it was a nice sounding album. And uh, yeah, Steve Steve did well on this as well as Buffalo. I mean, they sounded really good on Buffalo too. But I'm also I'm I'm uh, I like the Stingray sound. So I like this more because I know on uh, on Buffalo, Steve got him to play. Steve got Mike to play a, a P bass, which you know is fine. But I I like it better. I, I think it sounds better with the uh, Stingray cutting through uh, Tom's chords that way. But uh, yeah, really really great record. I I love this album. And again, it's like I, I it's sold like it, it you know. And obviously, it's one of the band's most beloved records. But like. I would I would put this up there with like some of the best selling punk records of the decade, and uh, you know I, I think it really too. I think they're, you know, they kind of I think even at that point were as strong of a trio as Green Day probably were at that point in their career. You know, I mean Green Day had started earlier, but I mean if you looked at wherever Green Day was, however many years MXPX was in at that point, I mean they were probably a band like five years I think maybe by the time they did this record. And, uh, yeah, I think they were about where Green Day would have been in, in terms of that. Like, I, I thought they were great. This kind of was their dookie, in uh, my opinion. Like, you know, like like where they had good songs before that, but this is the record where their first one that was, like, really, really good. I will say, though, and I before I move on, uh, you know, I, I will throw in one uh, negative thing. But uh, like, I, like I said with the other ones, some of them were, like, some of these albums I said were, like, perfect uh, length. This is a 17 song album. This is an album I'm talking about where I won't even, I'm not going to pinpoint certain songs I would say I'd cut because none are particularly shitty, but like there's a couple songs at the very end that I wouldn't think, I would still think the album's as good as it is if they weren't removed. Like there's some songs where if you said I'm going to remove songs A, B, C, and D, the quality of the record might diminish. Whereas if you took, uh, you know, if you took these ones out, I don't think anything would really change. I think I'd still love the record, you know? So I will say that I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pinpoint any as being shitty or really bad, but I just think there's a few later on that I'm like, yeah, you know, I wouldn't be sad if they didn't make the record. I will say Southbound is a great closer though. I think that's a really good way to close the uh, record. You know, I, I really like how they did that, but uh, moving on 
to, I mean, the greatest, the greatest, I would say, probably ska punk record of the 90s. One of the greatest ska punk records of uh, all time. But, I mean, they're up there with the 90s with, uh, you know, all the greats like uh, Les and Jake. But uh, The Suicide Machine's Destruction by Definition, that came out May of 1996. A, uh, I mean, just a classic. I love this record. It is, like I said, one of the greatest uh, all-time ska punk records. If Operation Ivy didn't exist... This might be up there, I would say, is one of the best. And, I mean, Less Than Jake, it's hard to say because I might throw one of Less Than Jake records up there too. But Less Than Jake might be in second place if I threw this in first. But, I mean, yeah, if Op Ivy didn't exist. And, I mean, really they're kind of like the Op Ivy of the 90s, I I think, because they really had that nice mix of both punk and ska. Plus, they're like a ska band without a horn section. You know, They're also like that with Op Ivy. And I think, uh, you know, I think Jay, too, you know, vocally – I think I would definitely imagine he would say Jesse Michaels was a uh, pretty big inspiration on him. But, uh, you know, kind of kind of starting off, too, the drummer again, like I did with MXPX. My God, Derek Grant, I mean, which most people know from Alkaline Trio, but uh, you may not know he was the drummer of the Suicide Machines for the first two records. And, I mean, my God, his drumming on this album, I got to see them play this front to back in uh, 2015 in Syracuse. Uh, and it was amazing. And Derek Grant played with them and it was like, my God, I mean, you hear it on the record, you already realize how amazing it is, but to hear him play it live, it's like, holy shit. Like it's cool too, because don't get me wrong. I mean, it's still punk, like, uh, you know, like alkaline tree. Like it's not, it's not so left field. It's not like, you know, an experimental jazz band he plays in, but it's still a different side of his playing. You know what I mean? Like he plays differently than he does an alkaline trio. And it's cool to see that side. Like, you know, it also shows just what a goddamn great drummer he is because how versatile and that he can kind of do a little bit of everything. And uh, yeah, his drumming on this record, uh, you know, again, like with Yuri, it's like another one where it's like a lot of these songs are really, really fast punk rock songs. And uh, he's doing crazy fills and shit. And also just being very, very tight. Like, you know, and and in a ska punk record too where at the drop of a hat they will kind of do a little reggae thing and then jump back into like, you know, something really like punk or like even even now and then like a heavy metal riff or something. Like, you know, they'll just go all these different places. Like the drop of a hat, you know, Derek's uh, drumming really changes the mood a lot, you know. I, I really like it's amazing too for being, you know, they're a quartet, but I mean, they don't have two guitar players. I'm sure on the record they might have, you know, like did some overdubs and stuff, but like really for being a band with, you know, drummer, bassist, guitarist, and vocalist, um, it's amazing like how full they sound and just how like loud and powerful their sound is, you know. But I mean I think I think part of it's that having solid drummer like a Derek Grant and, you know, having uh, that whole lineup though, that's kind of the quote unquote classic lineup on this record is uh, just really, really solid. You know, I mean this and battle hymns, you know, there's a reason they're kind of the uh, two like fan favorites and don't get me wrong. They rate great. They wrote great records after this and uh, revolution spring from last year, I think is on par with this record. I, I really think they, uh, I really think they outdid themselves. I truly mean that too. I think it's on it's on par. I'm not saying it's better than destruction by definition, but I'm saying about as good as it. And uh but yeah, getting back to destruction by uh definition, another one which actually I own on vinyl, which I'm sure is uh I'm pretty sure is worth a fuck ton. And by a fuck ton I mean like a hundred something dollars, which is a lot considering I paid like twenty dollars for it when it came out in two thousand fourteen or two thousand thirteen, I think it came out. But uh it it's another it is another album though i will say it's a long one and again i won't pinpoint any any songs but you could cut a couple songs off of this record and still be okay it, i would still regard this as one of the greatest releases of 1996 even if you took off a couple album uh, songs at the end but uh you know and kind of bringing up green day again but like i was thinking this because I think I I you get the Green Day comparison with them. It would break Anchor even more. Uh, Jason's uh, other band, really really good band, and you can definitely hear some Green Day in that. But it's like I think you hear Green Day in the Suicide Machines. But also I was thinking about it. I also think the Suicide Machines are what Green Day would sound like if they were a punk band, or I mean a ska band. You know, like I like I think if Green Day took their hand besides King for a day. But like, if they were like, we're going to do kind of a ska thing, but without like a horn section and just like, just them as a trio do ska, you know, kind of like op Ivy like that. I think they would sound like, uh, you know, I really do think they would sound like the suicide machines, 
you know, this, this is another record where like, again, it, it holds, it's one of their most successful records. I mean, and that, you know, it, it wasn't, it didn't sell crazy amounts, but like it is, it is one of the best of the nineties. It's one of the, like of the decade, not just the year. Like, I mean, this is one of the best albums of the nineties. Like if I was doing like a top 20, I would, I would say this is definitely on that list. I would 100% say that it's just such a, uh, I also think the production on it was well, be like really well done. Cause it doesn't sound dated. I mean, besides the fact that it's ska, which really ska's already making a comeback. So it's like, that doesn't even, you know what I mean? Like it's really not dated out of that anyway, but, uh, you know, it sounds good. Doesn't, I don't think it sounds like of its time or anything like that. And, uh, just such a great, just such a great record. I, uh, I love it. I also think it's a ska album that punks who don't particularly like ska will like, you know, like, I think there's a lot of people who are into, who don't particularly like ska who do like this record. You know, it's just, it's such a classic and, uh, you know, the, the, the band, the band was just really, I mean, it's such a, it's such a, uh, damn good way to like, you know, I think a lot of people were introduced by the band from that album and, uh, it's just such a great introduction. But uh, moving on to, uh, I, I'd say the, I'd say probably the last one here. But uh, we got Paul Westerberg. I mean, I talk so much about the replacements. Got to talk about Paul Westerberg. But uh, eventually, and uh, this is this is his second solo record. Third, if you want to be one of those people who uh, consider uh, all shook down his uh, his solo his first solo record. But the interesting thing about this album is uh, it's honestly. His last attempt, I think, at a mainstream acceptance. Like, this is really the last record with, like, you know, going into a proper studio, having, like, a proper producer, really, like, trying to, like, clean up his sound and kind of have a radio-friendly sound. Like, this was it. Like, he, him playing the game, you know, as you would say, which he maybe kind of did on, you know, like, Don't Tell a Soul or All Shook Down, you know, just just having more of a radio friendly sound, if you will, but like doing that on that, and then with fourteen songs, and then eventually, like I think it was like the four albums. If if there's any music where I think Westerberg was trying to maybe have a more, and I love all those records. You know, I'm not saying it like it's just soulless pop garbage or anything like that. But yeah, if he was trying to go for a sound that would make him a household name or make him popular, just give him a hit. It was those four records, and this is it. This is the bookend of that, uh, you know, that that four album, uh, you know, saga or whatever. Where, uh, yeah, it, it's like this. This is the end of the line for him. It's like this album didn't sell. It didn't make him a household name. It didn't put him in arenas. And uh, I think it was it for him. You know, I, I think that was about all he could give them. And uh, obviously, it, it's another one kind of like with Pinkerton, which uh, it's kind of a what if. Like, I also go and look at, I love, a, I think his best solo stuff came after this. I think his next two records are probably his best solo efforts. And uh, I, I, I do wonder, though, if this record, had it been big, if Paul Westerberg would have continued, like, Long, because I like, like I said, I like the four albums that I think are more mainstream friendly. But had he gotten a huge, huge hit, I wonder if, like, we would have been, you know what I mean? Like, if Dyslexic Heart, even though it was, a, it was probably his most well-known song, though it's not a huge song, it's like if that song blew up and he had to keep rewrite, you know, or not had to, but, like, he chose to and kept rewriting Dyslexic Heart and just trying to write hit after hit, it's like, you know, he could have tarnished his legacy. You know what I mean? And it's kind of fucked up to say that. But what I guess it's not because it's the same thing with the replacements. It's like part of the charm in their legacy is that they, you know, were fuck-ups and that they never, you know, that they never did hit that stride that they probably should have. And they never did have that, you know, huge hit that they probably should have or had that gold record that they should have, you know. But it is interesting to think, like, if eventually sold really well, I wonder if he would have made, you know, if his next album would have been like, uh, you know, Sue Kane Gratification or uh, I, I think I just fucked that up. But uh, I, and I love that record, too. I, I would say it's my favorite uh, solo record of his. But just really, really good. I, I think eventually isn't his greatest solo album, 
but it has some really good songs. And I mean, front to back, it's good. Like, again, it's like, it's like the replacements. It's like you, when you talk about your favorites, it's like, Oh, I, I love all of them. Like I love all their records. It's like, I just happen to love this one. It's like, I just have to love please to meet me a little more than like, you know, sorry, ma or uh, Tim, you know, like that, that's all. And it's kind of the same thing with the solo records. And, uh, but yeah, like, I don't, I don't think it's a bad record. I do think you can hear, and I, I will say that for people who say like all shook down is like his first solo album. You do hear songs on this and I'm like, oh yeah, this could have fit on all shook down like this. You definitely, you see where he was going then where you're like, if you didn't know where he was going after all shook down, this is it, you know, like this is very much, you know, and I, I think this one might even have a little less rock edge to it than 14 songs did. I think 14 songs actually might have had a little more of a, uh, you know, kind of rock sound. Not, not that there's not on here. I do think, though, it's a little softer at times than uh, maybe than maybe sometimes people want to hear from Paul Westerberg, you know, which, again, I don't mind. But, uh, yeah, I also think, though, too, it's like. I don't know if it would have been huge because, like, yeah, it had a mainstream sound, but at the same time, it's not grunge enough for, like, what was going on in rock at the time. And I also – the other thing, too, is, like, I don't think Paul wanted to – it's interesting, like, that his solo career never really took off in the 90s because, as everyone says, everyone – all the big bands in the 90s were ripping off the replacements. You know, the Goo Goo Dolls, the Gin Blossoms, I mean, all those bands like that were all taking, you know, from the replacements or sound like the replacements – but funny enough, you know, Paul Westerberg wasn't writing solo records that sounded straight up like replacement albums. I don't, he didn't want to write Tim part two, you know, I, I think that was a very big part of it. And, uh, I, I do think that's interesting because it's like, even though it's too bad, he wasn't bigger and maybe had minor hit, you know, like with dyslexic heart thinks like those, you know, like the single soundtrack, but like, you know, at the same time, when you think of where music went, the fact that I think he kind of went eventually, even though he was doing a mainstream sound, it's funny, you know, I guess funny, but also fucked up and kind of the curse of Paul Westerberg that because he wasn't writing like he used to, because what he wrote in the 80s got him nowhere. In the 90s, everyone was ripping off what he did in the 80s and getting big, and he was no longer doing what he did in the 80s. You know, it is. Uh, it is it's calling, It's kind of the curse of, uh, of them. But uh, I think Paul's voice sounds really good on it. You know, Tommy Stinson does some bass and I believe saxophone as well. But I'm pretty sure you can hear some backing vocals from him. I think he's uncredited, but uh, I'm pretty sure you can hear his vocals on there. You know, I also don't think it has too different of a sound from uh, Friday Night is Killing Me. I really like listening to it again today. Uh, I didn't listen to it in a little while. When I put it on again, I'm like, and part of it's that, again, Tommy Stinson had uh, some role in it so it's like it's not too surprising it would have that similar you know that similar sound but it definitely does have certain vibes that uh you know friday night is killing me has you know which also isn't too surprising because friday night is killing me also has certain replacements but you know it's obvious that uh you know tommy learned from uh, one of the greats paul westerbergs he's in a band with him but uh yeah, this this record really good. Good day is such a nice it's such a nice tribute to Bob. I mean, it's such a beautiful song. You know, I, I like that. Uh, again, and and I don't know, Bob might have hated that song because he hated ballads and like things like that. But it's like I'll be damned if Paul Wester and that's why I think he's the greatest songwriter of all time. Is he can write a rocker and he can also write a song like Good Day. You know, he can make you laugh, he can make you cry, he can make you dance, he can make you mosh. He make you thrash. He can make you drink. He can make you, you know, whatever. Like that's, that's a good songwriter. He can make you have, feel whatever emotion he wants you to feel, you know? And, uh, yeah, I, I also think another one too, very good drummers on this record. Two of them, Josh freeze who, uh, anything he plays on with Paul is uh, always good. I think he plays similar and not so much that he plays this way in every band, but I think when he plays with Paul Westerberg, whether it be a solo stuff uh, you know, when he was playing with the replacements, uh, you know, he played drums in the I Don't Cares. I think he definitely has a – he tries to play in the vein of Chris Mars, I think, in a good way. Like, I think he is a fan of the replacements and everything, and I think he kind of gets Paul's sound. And and even though Paul might have talked shit about Chris's drumming in the past, Chris's drumming is a huge part of the replacements. And that's – and, you know, I, I think later on – with Paul doing stuff. I think, I think Josh still, you know, understood that. And that's part of the magic of, uh, 
you know, Paul's music. And, and I think he kept that, you know, and I think that's probably also why Paul might have, even though, again, it's funny. Cause it's like, even though Paul might've been like, Oh, Chris isn't a very good drummer and stuff. It's like, really? Cause I think Josh free seems pretty, uh, you know, influenced by the guy, but also Michael Bland, who is uh, now the drummer of soul asylum. And, uh, he played drums with Prince. Uh, I, I would love to interview him. Cause he, he is like played with twin cities royalty. Like he's played on so many different really rad records with different rad bands. I've seen him live with Soul Asylum a couple times, and like really, really good fucking drummer, really, really tight drummer. He 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 sounds amazing with uh, with uh, Soul Asylum. But like him, him and Josh Freeze, I get. Like I get why they're both like session drummers and play with all these different bands. Is like they're just really fucking tight. Like he got really good drummers on this record, like really tight. And I don't think Michael Bland plays so much like Chris Mars. I feel like you can kind of tell the songs where Michael plays and the ones that Josh plays, but I think Josh plays more straight up like Chris Mars, which again, I don't think it's a bad thing. Cause I think Chris Mars is a, uh, a, you know, I very much disagree with Paul. I think Chris Mars is a great drummer and, uh, yeah, I love this record again. I don't think it's his best uh, solo record, but it's Paul Westerberg. It's a fucking great record. You know what I mean? Like it's still a great fucking record, but, uh, yeah, you know, so those are, like I said, I wouldn't have time, you know, I, I know we're about an hour and a half here, so I thought we would close it up, but, uh, yeah, I mean the, the list could go on. I did, I was going to talk about Jimmy Eat world with static prevails, but I know I've talked a little bit about it on here before. And, uh, I've talked a lot about clarity and stuff, but you know, like that's another one where, uh, you know, just talking about like great records in 1996. That's another one where it's like, I think the charm of it though, is that it sounds like 1996. You know, like I said, some records don't sound of their time. I think part of the charm of static prevails is the fact that it does kind of sound like 1996. You know, it does sound like it was released that year, but, uh, I, I do think it's an overlooked Jimmy world album though. Like I, like I really, I, I would, again, if we're playing what ifs, it's like, you know, if, uh, if that album got bigger, and, you know, Tom kind of stayed doing like, like, you know, switching, uh, like switching turns with a uh, Jim doing a uh, co-lead vocals, you know, it'd be interesting if, you know, to see if he would write more. Cause it's just so interesting that like, he just doesn't have songs in Jimmy Eat world after clarity that he just stopped. You know what I mean? Like just all together that like throughout the years, he wouldn't at least have a couple on the records, which I can't be the only one who would love to hear Tom do some more songs on Jimmy world records. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's something that's cool about stack prevails far from their best record either. I, and I don't think it sucks. I love that record, but I think it's like probably my, uh, I'd go clarity bleed American. And then I don't know. I do say I stack prevails, maybe third, but I'm thinking more fourth third might be, uh, I don't know. I like futures, but I don't like futures the way a lot of people do. But you know what? No, I would put surviving probably at third. I gen- I think I think surviving might be my third favorite. That record's really good, and it's been out now for a few years. So like, I know that it's still as good as I thought it was, and I, I really like that. I, I like when Jimmy Eat World. I I mean, I don't get me wrong. I also like when they do like the whole clarity. Thing. I would love another record that kind of had that clarity vibe. But I like when they do just kind of a straight up pop rock record. And that's what they do with surviving. Like they're just kind of like. It's a like they do a couple cool things on it, but like it's pretty much a straight pop rock record. I feel like, and it's just Jimmy World doing what they do best, like really, really good catchy pop rock, you know. And uh, I, I think they did that well here though too on Stack Prevails. You know, I think I think of the time, you know, again it kind of sounds of its era, but of that time, I think it was awesome. You know, the sound. I mean, it definitely has something kind of akin to uh, you know early Get Up Kids. You know, definitely kind of a similar sound on there. But and you can kind of see foreshadows of clarity as well on there, but uh, yeah, it, it, it is interesting to think of if it would have been bigger for them, if uh, you know you would hear Tom more on uh, you know Jimmy Eat World records, which I would not have a problem with. Again, I love and the two uh, Tom songs on Clarity are like a huge highlight of Clarity. Those are like some of the best songs on the album. So uh, yeah, I th- those are uh, those are some records from 1996. 25 years old this year, hard to believe. For uh, some of them, some of them I'm not that that surprised, but uh, a few of them I'm like, fuck, I can't believe that's 25 years old. But uh, yeah, you know, that's always fun looking back for anniversaries. I always like doing that, you know, not a uh, not a brand new idea. I know a lot of people do retrospectives and everything, but it is fun to kind of look back 25 years. You're like, oh, what was music like? And, uh, you know, something I noticed, too, because like I think just about every album I talked about was on a major label. And it's like 
I just can't imagine any of any of these bands really being signed in another time besides the nineties, like as much shit in, on a major label. And it's like, just because, and nothing against them again, but it's like, they were just either their sound wasn't of their time or what they were doing was too different. Like, I just don't see a major label taking a chance on them after a while. Like if you didn't sound like band A, B or C, they're not going to sign you. Whereas look at some of these bands. Like, I mean, even the suicide machines were on a label owned by Disney I mean, for Christ's sakes, you know, like how crazy is that? And, you know, the fact that an album that sounds like Operation Ivy would be released on a major label and like readily available places, which is awesome. And it's like, you know, that's the thing as shady as major labels can be and shitty things that maybe they did. It's also cool that there was an era where I feel like they really gave a chance to bands that never would be on a major label otherwise. You would never, a major label would never put any of these records out now or sign these bands present day or even 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you know? But uh, yeah, I mean, credit where credit's due, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, again, there's a lot of flaws with major labels, but, you know, kudos to them for at least taking a chance on a lot of these bands back in the day. At least the ones that didn't fuck them over. I know, I know not everyone. I don't think Super Drag left super uh, great with uh, Electra, and I'm sure a few of the other ones may have uh, choice things to say about their label. But you know, still kind of cool that they would uh, take a chance on them. But that is the episode class in 1996. Episode 68. Thank you so much for checking it out. If you want to stay connected with the show, follow us at Power Chord Hour on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We are on uh, Spotify, and each week I put up new playlists from the radio show. So you can go follow us on there. And the radio show, those are new episodes every Friday night, 10 to midnight Eastern on 107.9 WRFA in Jamestown, New York. Check that out. I uh, play punk, alternative, you know, the kind of music I, I play on here. I'll probably play some of these bands this week to uh, kind of tease the uh, podcast. So if you're listening, go check out the radio show. And uh, like I said, 107.9 WRFA in Jamestown, New York. But if you don't live here, uh, go check us out online, WRFALP.com. And uh, you can stream the uh, you can stream the station on there. And WRFA also has a has a uh, app where you can stream the station on that. If you have an iPhone, just go check that out. You can stream the show every Friday night, as well as all the other rad shows here on the uh, station. And uh, yeah, there's that. Hit me up, powercordhour at gmail dot com. I got free Power Chord Hour stickers. Uh, if you listen to the radio show, you want to send in song requests, you can email me song requests. If you just want to talk music, you want to talk something about this episode, anything, hit me up, powercordhour at gmail.com. Spread the word to your friends. That would be awesome. You know, the show's free and everything. And uh, if you would, rate and review us, subscribe, all that good stuff. All the shit that podcasters beg you to do. All that, if you do it for me, it would be very rad. If not, well, that sucks, but I'll accept it. But uh, thanks for listening, first and foremost. Thank you for listening to this. So uh, until next week for the Power Chord Hour, I'm Anthony Merchant, and thank you for listening.